Yes. Welcome, everybody. We'll, one, we'll get this session underway. This is um, the first of the streams of the second day. You're in students in the driver's seat. You can move all three hats and have human experience. Just to make sure you're in the right one. I'm, I'm the, the chair for the day, or for this session. I'm Peter O'Brien from, from IT. But I reckon a good chair is a chair that you can get really quickly. So I'm going to sit down, and Melissa McKnight from Science is going to tell us all about using quizzes in your Awesome. Okay, can you hear me all right? So uh, my name is Melissa, I'm a teaching associate in Sci 2010, which is a core science unit um, off of many campuses. Um, so I'm just a teaching associate, I've just made a couple of quizzes this semester for our unit and I had a lot of fun doing it and I got a bit excited about what we could do with Moodle quizzes and um, mentioned to Kirsty and Rose that I wouldn't mind coming to this conference and they said, well, submit an abstract and I was like, well, okay. So I'm going to talk a bit about what I do with quizzes, what we've been doing with quizzes in our unit. And I feel a bit nervous, so I think quite heavy. Which is what I do with my students when I'm teaching. But that's okay. Hopefully it's not too boring if I sit down. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm talk about what's so good about quizzes is just a little bit. Um, and a little bit about of research about quizzes and how quizzes can assist learning. And how we use quizzes in the site when we can. Uh, what else? Our plans for 2013. It's just some things that I'm keen to try out with the with the kids, and then I'm going to talk about some question type options, and then I'm going to have a brief demonstration how to make a particular question type that I really like that I find a little bit mysterious, so I'm going to leave a bit of a demo on that. So what's so good about quizzes? Um, everybody seems to do quizzes for all sorts of silly reasons. If you look online, online quizzes, you can find out what sort of pot plant you are, and what kind of, <laughs> what kind of Star Wars character you are. And I did this quiz. I just kind of Google fun quizzes, and it turns out I'm Han Solo. <laughs> and I didn't really want to be Han Solo, so I took the quiz again to try and not be Han Solo. <laughs> and then I was Chewbacca and Han Solo in two parts. <laughs> so that wasn't very fun. But I've probably told my friends about this on Facebook. Everybody else wants to know which Star Wars character they were. Kirsty is Obi Wan. So I was a bit jealous of the Obi Wan. Can't follow. Um, and I'm also a German Shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> and it says I'd be a good athlete. Or a policeman in the wilderness guy or a meteorologist. So I'm not, none of those. So Moodle quizzes are awesome. I think Moodle quizzes are awesome. I think students probably, if you write a good quiz, students are probably going to enjoy it. Um, the immediate feedback is good. I read a little bit of research that said the immediate feedback is actually good for students to get a sense of how well we're doing. Um, the automation and marking is great. We don't have to tick, check through things to see how students are going. And something that um, Rowan Brooks mentioned yesterday morning, morning tea, when we were talking about quizzes. If you have quizzes throughout semester and a bunch of students are getting a particular type of question wrong, a particular thing wrong, it gives you some good feedback to how, how you're, what you might be missing in your lectures and you could remedy that either then or next semester when you're writing a lecture, focus on that thing that students don't seem to be performing well on. That's a little diagram. I can think of things the students love that I don't also love and that I love that students like tin cans. It's kind of, everything had to go in the middle except for maybe Venn diagrams. I'm sure I've got some students that also like them diagrams. So I'm not an educational researcher or anything like that, but I was interested in finding out what the research says about quizzes. So I found a bunch of studies that show that taking online quizzes, well, quizzes improve exam performance, and these studies were in all sorts of things, like from high school to all different um, majors at university, um, and, a, and, a, and a range of subjects. Like some of these quizzes had some of these studies had huge you know, numbers of participants. Um, I also found a piece of research that said quizzes are better than rereading course notes. So I think it goes to what um, Shirley said this morning about the passive learning. The quizzes are something that you're actually doing rather than just sitting staring at a page. And that online quizzes, this is just one study, they're better than paper and pencil. And this seems to make sense to me. Like most, I, I've got a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old and they play with Khan a lot. And it's, so it's like a math, math thing, you can do math questions online, and they love it. And I think part of the reason they love it is they get to know whether they're right or wrong straight away. I can't imagine they would sit there with a paper and pencil, you know, doing their homework, filling out their quiz, they wouldn't get their stuff. They wouldn't be so keen to do that if they had to wait for tomorrow to find out how well they did. Um, and this piece of research 
a very interesting one study even found that students rated course content and the assessor more positively when they took quizzes during the semester. So that's been fun. Okay, so how do we use quizzes inside 2010? Okay, so we, we really do use them as a learning tool. We don't, the students get a, what am I saying here? Several short quizzes throughout the semester. I don't remember how many have you had, maybe six? Six quizzes throughout the semester, and they pretty much reinforce the lecture material. And the students get a very, very small mark for participating in the quizzes only. They don't get a better mark if they get 100% or 50% or anything like that. And we get really good participation rates. So one little quiz, they have about 750 students. And so this is just some screenshots that I took. So I couldn't figure out exactly how many students altogether took the quiz, but there were 1,080 attempts made on this quiz. I was particularly interested in this quiz because this was my first quiz that I made and I was watching the students as they took the quiz. 1,080 attempts. So they get three, each student gets three goes to have a go at the quiz. And this graph shows that um, 400 students got between 95 and 100% in the quiz. So this suggested to me that the students took the quiz and some other things that I looked at see that the students were taking the quiz again and again until they got 100%. And granted, it's pretty easy to get 100% the next time or the third time because we give them the answer <laughs> after they do it the first time. So all they have to do is you know, remember the answer until the next time they do the quiz and they do it again. But they're doing it again, even though they don't have to. We make it very clear that they only get participation marks, but they're doing it again. So I, that got me thinking, if this is a natural tendency to want to get 100%, maybe I can make it a little bit harder for them to get 100%. So this is something we're going to try next semester. Well, I hope we're going to try it. So I want to try it. I haven't really got permission from anybody yet. <laughs> we're totally trying it. We're totally trying it. Thanks. So, here's, here's. so what I'm thinking we can do, instead of... This is essentially what I want to do with this apparently natural tendency. Find out if we can assist learning by encouraging recall, recall with hints. So still, like we did this semester, we're going to give them a couple of chances to have a go at the quiz. But this time we're just going to provide hints um, in the form of, the, like when you make a Moodle quiz, you can give general feedback and specific feedback. In those boxes, put a hint to help them figure out how to, what the correct solution would be. That's sort of giving them more chance to find that spot in the brain with that piece of information. It's like, I'm a neuroscientist, but I imagine that recall process is good for helping you cement things in your mind. So they don't get any correct answers after they do the quiz, but when the quiz is closed, then the right answer would appear. So it's pretty important that at some point they do see the right answer, even if they haven't got it right. Um, so all you have to do, it's really simple, like this is the settings. When you set up a quiz, you just have to untick right answer here and right answer here. That's all you have to do. Students will get the feedback that you've written, um, either specific or general, and then once your quiz is closed, they get the the right answer. So you might just have your quiz open for a week or something like that, I guess. Okay. So it was it got me thinking, oh, I was really good actually to hear Shirley say this morning about using intuition or what kind of feels right, like what, what I think will work and not having necessarily having done the research, because I kind of think I, I imagine there are different ways of assisting learning and I think these things will work, but I don't really know. I couldn't really find much research about it, but it doesn't hurt to try them out. So this is one thing I think, is if we don't always make the correct answer visible, we encourage recall by giving them a short answer question instead where they have to actually think of the thing rather than just tick the correct answer. Sometimes it's not reasonable. For example, sometimes you wouldn't want to use short answer. So what is the correct name for this Mexican hairless dog? Does anybody know how to pronounce that word? <laughs> So I think the students would be penalised unfairly it's, it's for not being able to spell. It's It's quack. Quack. It's quack. Yes. So I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. But if you're ever playing an A to Z game with kids and you have to think of an animal that starts with X, this is it. I think you can just call it Zola. Is that it? <laughs> so anyway, this one, if you were going to ask this question, this would be a good multiple choice question. But otherwise, short answer can be good. Another thing that's really important in short answer questions is that you make sure you put all the possible options in there. Like you can say which are the correct answers for a short answer question. I, I wrote a short answer question last semester that was, the answer was Newton. So I said the students can write Isaac Newton or they can write Newton and that would be correct. But then 
I said, lucky I saw this early. One student wrote, Sir Isaac Newton. And they got it wrong. And then I was like, oh no, no. that student would have been so annoyed. I would be if I was a student, so I had to go back and change it. So the student got the right time. So you just need to make sure you consider all the possibilities. So another thing I think, so requiring application of knowledge. So rather than just sort of rote learning and remem remembering facts, find some way that the students can apply what they know. So this is a card. My boyfriend is a total geek and I asked him, you know, can you think of something about some problem solving question? So I can give an example and he told me about this Mason's card hypothesis. So essentially you've got these four cards and whenever a pair of cards, whenever you pair a picture card and an ace, a uh, picture card and a number card together and you lay four out, the ace is always paired. Someone hypothesizes that ace is always paired with a non-numbered card. What do you have to do to falsify that hypothesis which card? So this is a we would use this in the camera. This is an example of a problem solving question. And they can select one or more. So I couldn't think of any other good examples, but I'm sure in your specific field there's a, there's a perfect subject that you can write problem solving questions for. Um, some other things I was thinking about is tailoring, tailoring questions for learning styles. So not everybody learns best or remembers things best when they're looking at text. So now we use a photograph, a flow chart, and you can even embed videos in your Moodle questions, which I figured out how to do a couple of days ago. And I'll show you later when I do a demo. It's pretty easy. Uh, but here's a flow chart that um, Roz shows in our lectures, which is a, like a, a scientific process. Um, the students just have to pick which goes here. Um, and I also think using a variety of question styles in a quiz in itself is good for generating, you know, maintaining interest. If you're going to give the students a quiz every week or a couple of every couple of weeks, if you can use a bunch of different types of question styles, that's going to uh, possibly is going to improve participation. I know it would work for me. So I've just realised that I haven't signed in for Moodle or anything. I'm going to do that right now. I meant to. Bear with me. Sorry about this. It's my bad. It'll all be worth it. I hope so. Ah! I have this fancy code in my brain for how what my passwords will be depending on the site. Sometimes that code is broken. I think in this case it's broken. Go Moodle. For some reason, the place I want it is hidden. Now I have so many units. There it is. So don't worry, I hid this quiz from the students, Kirsty. <laughs> so this is, I've just set up a little bit of a demo and I'll go through, the, I just put five different questions that I've been fiddling around with. They're not questions that I would give, wait, I'm going to use. It's just kind of showing you the kind of things we can do um, with writing different types of questions. So this is a match pairs question. Um, so you just make a list of things down one side and then the correct answers appear in, um, the answer, the possible options appear in drop down boxes, which are repeated. So do you want, I want to answer these questions incorrectly because then we'll get to see what the feedback looks like. So this is just very silly. Students learn about all these things. So we've got Occam, Apple, Bath and Razor. I'm just totally... Pardon? It was Razor. It was, but we, we, we want to get it wrong. So we'll say Newton had a bath and Archimedes had an apple. Oh, they're all going to be, these are all going to be kind of sciencey. I apologise. Can you see this all right? I'll just make it slightly bigger for you. Make, okay. Lovely, or maybe that probably won't work. Like that. So this is now, yep. So this is a video that I've got a friend who's a mathematician. He makes the most awesome. He's like a topologist, and he makes awesome little three D printed things. Um, and that, this is a, he puts videos of them on YouTube. And so I wanted a video that I was allowed to use without having to ask for copyright or whatever. So I'll play this video. It's only twenty eight seconds. Because it's neat. This is 
Sorry that you couldn't hear part of it. You missed the answer. That's good because we want to get it wrong. Now I want to turn this down. So I'm going to put the wrong answer. The, the correct answer was parabol parabolic. So I'm just going to put something silly, orbital. I actually planned to write George in all the answers, but I forgot that. <laughs> so here's another type of question. Um, this is a numerical one. So this is, I guess, a problem-solving type of question. We've given the students a piece of text from the results section of a paper. Is that me making that noise? No, it's some, some, some workers. Some workers? Okay. Rats. Rats, possums if it was my, at my place. So th this is a numerical question. So basically, I've, I, when I set up this question, I put what the correct answer is, and then I put how far can the students be wrong and still get the question right. So the correct answer is, I think, 45. But I want to get this wrong, so I'm going to put 21. And here's my thing that doesn't fit on the screen. You can't see all the cards. Okay, so this is King a of clubs. king of clubs. <laughs> Beautiful. So this is a problem-solving question, like I showed you before. Do you want to have a go at this? Which two cards do you need to turn over to falsify the hypothesis that every ace will have an odd number underneath it? Two, two cards. Well, potentially, hypothe potentially falsify the hypothesis. Ace, well, the ace is one, but there's two. So out of the three or six, which one would be able to falsify the hypothesis? The even number one. But let's get this wrong. Uh, it is six of spades, but let's, let's do three of hearts. So this is my favourite question type, and I'm going to explain how to write this question type, and only because it's a little bit mysterious. So I wonder if this is a closed question. I mean, maybe you guys remember these from high school where you have to fill in the blanks. Um, the reason I like this question is because when I noticed this question was available on Moodle, I couldn't find any instructions how to write this question. So I was like, yay, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to make it my personal challenge. So I did a bit of Googling and I found a little bit of code you have to write. So after, after our, towards the end of my talk, I'll explain how to write a closed question if you're interested. So, this closed question has three sub-questions in it. It's got a short answer spot. So I'm going to put a wrong... This question type is commonly known as George. <laughs> this part of the question is a numerical thing. So I probably, you probably wouldn't do it this way because it's not obvious to the student what they have to write. Uh, it, there's three variations. And then you can also put mo a multiple choice question in your embedded answers. So it's also known as embedded answer or embed in pyjamas because that was the thing that came to mind that rhymes kind of with that. So I'm going to put that even though we know it's wrong. So we'll submit it all and finish. So this is the kind of way, this is gonna, what's going to happen. Students get their mark here and at the top for the whole quiz and they get, well, they get all these wrong and then this is where you put your hint. So this is just... My boyfriend got really annoyed with me about this because he's a mathematician. He's like, I don't get this really. <laughs> yes, you do. So that's a hint. Um, and a hint for the video. These hints are very silly, but you would write really informative hints that help the students find that thing in their brain. Well, I guess it starts with P is a bit as a useful hint. You might also just tell the students where they need to go and look to find that information before they do it you might need to revise these lecture notes or this page or whatever. So here's another one. So that's how they appear. And for the, in this question, you can either write a comment that will appear at the bottom in the feedback, or you can write specific comments that appear at the bottom of each one. So consider how looking at this pair could support your hypothesis but not falsify it. So if you turn the three of hearts and had an ace, that would support your hypothesis. But if it didn't have an ace, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't, doesn't falsify your hypothesis because you're not saying that under every odd number you're going to get an ace. That's what's cool about it. I like this. I think it's about sort of confirmation bias, this puzzle. And here's the embedded answer. Now, the embedded answer feedback works a little bit different. You can't see anything on the screen. But when you hover over the axis, you see the hint. So hint at rhymes with things you wear. And this, I think, says get up and have a coffee. <laughs> Think about it again. 
So that's how some of the things that you can do with quizzes to make them a little bit more interesting rather than just the regular multiple choice. Okay. 1151. So that's so just in case I had Moodle dramas, I put a couple of pictures in. Uh, oh, so these can all be automatically marked. Like the essay questions, you can't automatically mark them, of course, but most of the, all the other question types you can. And most of them are pretty easy. So I've showed you these already. Okay, so I can... Oh, my nice prompt didn't work. I can explain a particular question type if you'd like me to. I really, really, really want to talk about clothes because it's a little bit of code and it makes me very excited. Um, and if you want to write clothes questions, it might be hard for you to figure it out because I spent quite a bit of time doing it. Or I can show you how to add images, which is pretty easy to do and how to do things. So you have to me to talk about clothes first, and then if we've got time, I can do the other things. Please I talk to us about clothes. Excellent. <laughs> I also made um, printouts of these next slides. So if you want to make your own, because I'll show you. Clothes. So essentially, when you set up your quiz, you pick the how to add an embedded, uh, add an embedded answer question, and you write your question and this little bit of code in this box here. Same as any other question, like a multiple choice question. But with this one, the answers are all built into the question. So this is how you do it. You have little bits of code where your answers are up here. And you start and end the code with these curly braces. Curly braces are my favourite type of punctuation. So at the end, beginning and end. Then you designate the mark. So this question type overall is going to be worth three. And each one, each part of the question is worth one. Sometimes there might be an easy question, which is you only want to make half, and you want to, so you want to wait it. So you can give it a mark, give it a number. Will you share this with us? Yes. Now? You mean I've got, I've got some, I've got some printouts. Okay. I get them out. I get them out. I've got printouts. You can get them from my backpack if you want. Kirsten. So put columns either side, not like large intestines. <laughs> my cats have got a thing for large intestines. They leave them on my doorstep. Um, put columns either side of the sub-question type. Then put the sub-question type in capital letters. So there's three types you can use. Short answer. You can actually write the whole word short answer or just SA. Numerical or multiple choice. So normally your clothes wouldn't need to be this complicated. I put all three types in the one question just so I could demonstrate them. But you might just have one. An equal sign. This is very easy. You put the correct answer after the equal sign. So um, it looks a bit different. Well, I guess it all looks the same. The correct answer always looks the same in the different types. Then if you're going to have answer options, which you need to have if you're going to do multiple choice, you put a uh, squiggle, and then you put all the other answer options. And if, if you've got more than one correct answer, you just put more than one equal sign. Um, and then after each answer, you put the comment, and the comment begins with a hash. Is that what you call these? Hash? Yeah. Yeah. So just. And clearly, no spaces between, between any, any of the no. symbols. No spaces. Oh, no, 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 possibly. No, no spaces. No spaces. I think it's very difficult. No spaces. No spaces? Yeah. No spaces. And with the, with the short answer questions, if they essentially write anything that's not the right answer and you want to give them feedback, you just put an asterisk. So basically, if they write close, they get it right. Um, if they write anything else, this is the hint that they get. Oh, and numerical, because I'm not going to, I might not show you how to write a numerical question. Um, the correct answer is three. I haven't specified what the wrong answer is. The correct answer is three, and it can be up to one wrong. So it can be two, three, or four, and the student will still get it right. So you write the correct answer, and then a colon, and then how far it can deviate from what the correct answer is. That makes sense? Yes. You don't need the deviation. If, if it's only three, it's only three. Yeah? Just, I'm just thinking, with the multiple choice, it's only, that's a pull-down box, it's only a single choice option. Is it there from that? Ah, yes, you're right. So it could only be right. Yes, it can only be one. Good point. So yes, you've only got, you can only have one correct answer for this one. Perfect. But you can have, have five different options. You can have a whole bunch of different, yes. Yes, but you can only have one. That's a good point. 
Okay, so is there anything else in particular that you want me to show you how to do? Video? Video is really easy. Okay, where's my thing? So I'm going to assume that you all kind of know how to make, how to get to the, I'm going to make a quiz page. So I'll just go to the edit quiz. So basically you get your quiz up, whatever it is, once you've set it up, then you go create a new question. Um, what do we do? So what, you can put a video in any question type. Just, we are squeezed for time, but let's just keep this running. No, no, I'll, I'll be shorter. So but if you, yeah, if, if you have to go to another room, yeah. we'll just keep going. Yeah, I'm cool with that. Yeah. Keep going. I'll just show the video thing and then, yeah. All right, so let's put it in a short answer. So it just, it's very simple. See here, it's got Moodle Media insert edit you just click Moodle media and then it says find or upload sound video or applet and then you've just got all those options so it's very simple you can load something from YouTube from you can load something from YouTube I couldn't get it to work but Lee May assures me so we'll just click YouTube we, I'll look at my cool mathematician friend ah. The upload, the embed used to work, but the ah. latest version, it's not working currently. Mitch knows about it. Oh no, look, now it is. Is that working on Mitch? Yes. And maybe they fixed it. So, anyway, a bunch of videos, and you just pick that one. Yeah. One of those? Yeah, I'm going to pick the So, are you happy with that? You're welcome. So, I'll just go back to my thing. If you have any questions about making quizzes, um, and you want to contact me, this is my email address. I'm Melissa McKnight. Email 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 you can just find me inside 2010. And <laughs> so ooh, take the Star Wars quiz. This is brilliant. We, can we have the hand up? This yes, Kirsty has it. Oh, it's right here. Oh, we have the last one. Oh, okay. Melissa, you are an education researcher.